Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Stephen B. Smith, the Alfred Coles Professor of Political Science and co-director of the Center for the Study of Representative Institutions at the Macmillan Center, which focuses on the theory and practice of representative government in the Anglo-American world. His research interests include the history of political philosophy with special attention to the problem of the ancients and moderns, the relation of religion and politics, and theories of representative government. His best known publications include Spinoza's Book of Life, The Cambridge Companion to Leo Strauss, and Political Philosophy. Today we'll speak with Professor Smith about his new book, Modernity and Its Discontents, Making and Unmaking the, the Bourgeois from Machiavelli to Bello. Welcome, Professor Smith. It's my pleasure. Nice to be here with you. Thank you. Let's begin with an overview of okay. your book. Tell us about it. Okay, the book grew out of a very simple question. Ask the question, why is the United States the most powerful, prosperous, and freest country in the world? Why, why are we so continually beset by discontent? Mm -hmm. That's the, the broad, very broad question uh, the book tries to ask. And it tries to do so not by looking at the sort of usual suspects, which, you know, congressional dysfunction or the direction of the economy or, or something like this. It really looks more deeply at the question of the kind of civilization that the modern West has produced. Uh, the civilization that I, I call, not uh, my own term obviously, that I call bourgeois civilization. Mm -hmm. We have produced the modern West a unique and special kind of human individual, the bourgeois and all of that, all that that represents. What does that represent? Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Okay. I'm going to get to that. <laughs> and most of what I call in the book are discontents derive from this, the emergence of this type. Okay. What is the bourgeois? Uh, I, I, it's a familiar term in, in some some respects. Mm -hmm. uh, probably most famously, but, but not only associated with the name of Karl Marx, mm -hmm. although that's not particularly the way I use the term in the book. Uh, the bourgeois is a character type. Every society, I argue, produces a distinctive character type, the warrior, the priest, the uh, hero, whatever. We, we our, our modern society has produced its own character type, unprecedented in human history, called the bourgeois. It began to emerge in the 16th and 17th century, mm -hmm. and the book deals with uh, early iterations of the expression of this, of this character type in works by people like Machiavelli and Rene Descartes and, and, and Thomas Hobbes and so on. But the bourgeois is er originally emerged as a the idea of the sort of free and responsible individual, uh, unbeholden to guild or church or neighborhood or fiefdom, any particular association. Mm -hmm. It was to be to be the the bourgeois was a new kind of human being on the face of the earth, someone who was their own person, un bound by tradition and authority, free to make themselves and become themselves. And of course, the kind of classic bourgeois story, w which I discuss in the book, is, mm -hmm. is, is it works something like Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, the story of the self-made man, a person who, uh, you know, unbeholden, makes themselves to be what they are. It's a heroic, in many ways, it's a very heroic picture. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I want to argue, it was the very success of this character type that has produced a reaction to it and a kind of anti-bourgeois backlash, mm -hmm. you might say, that began also around the mid to late 18th century. We can get into that and which received philosophical, literary, and political expression and throughout the 19th and the 20th century in this phenomenon of the kind of anti-bourgeois. Mm -hmm. And that took many, many forms. But those are, those are the sources, or that is the unique source, I want to argue, of the kind of discontent that we are so beset with, okay. with today that underlies, I think, the, 
the various currents of you know contemporary dissatisfaction with ourselves. Okay. When you use the term modern, mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, modern. Yes. I mean, we all naturally think of ourselves as modern men and women, people people of today. Uh, the concept of modernity, uh, which is a philosophical term. Uh, is really something that we typically, uh, not always, but I think typically trace back to the 16th, 17th centuries with, again, the emergence uh, of not only this new type of individual that I've been describing, but of course a whole new kind of society which would give uh, support and sustenance to that kind of individual. What do I mean by that? A kind of bourgeois civilization that, with which is associated with modernity. I mean by that a society that uh, validates scientific modes of investigation, science and kind of unfettered uses of science and technology as a marker of human progress. The conception related to this, for example, of the marketplace, the emergence of the market, uh, and market society as the sort of definitive allocators of you know goods and services, right. and of course the emergence of related phenomena, the pr phenomenon of what we think of as secularization, a, a religious world that we, that we think has now become somewhat privatized and no longer holds the dominant force that it, it had in earlier times, and, and needless to say, the beginning of modern democratic representative political institutions. These are all. Uh, the distinctive features that structural, institutional forms that, that modernity has taken. And I talk about some, I, I talk at, at various points about all of these in the book. But what most, in, most interests me, again, is the unique type of human being that this society produces, the bourgeois, the mm -hmm. modern individual. Okay. And again, the, uh, both the, uh, in many ways, it is one of our most precious achievements of the modern world definitely, mm -hmm. and yet it is the source of so much anxi fear, anxiety, and discontent right. that we now feel. So in your preface you state, modernity is a problem. Right. What do you mean by that? Okay, well, that draws on a bit of what, I, what I've just been saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, have, we typically get a kind of heroic conception of the modern world based on the a kind of enlightenment story that modernity begins with the, with the end of this kind of feudal and backward period, the kingdom of darkness, and we've been a slowly, progressively moving into an enlightened world of freedom and democracy and science and progress, a progressive narrative of human history. Right. That's the way the story is, is typically told. Uh, what I want to argue is that, in a way, it's only at best half the story, and it's a story that's come under increasing pressure mm -hmm. in the, you know, the last century, certainly. Uh, a pressure that began uh, early on, early on pe extremely prescient minds began to see that modernity was a problem, and in my own book, uh, I trace that back to Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm -hmm. it's a crucial chapter on, on Rousseau, who was the first to pinpoint uh, that this new civilization, which he, he, by the way, was, I believe, the first to define as the bourgeois world, oh, okay. uh, saw it uh, in his own way as a, as, a, as a world of falseness, duplicity, hypocrisy. This was behind all of the you know, refined mm -hmm. and progressive developments we have. He, he applied an absolutely brutal uh, we call moral critique mm -hmm. to, the, to, this, to this phenomenon, the world that was supposed to be governed by the mechanisms of self-interest and the hidden hand of economics. Rousseau exposed as false and duplicitous. And in many ways, Rousseau's powerful critique took hold uh, in a number of many, many writers in the 19th and, and 20th century mm -hmm. who took this in, in very different directions. Mm -hmm. Uh, some like Marx, who was very much uh, in this respect a disciple of Rousseau, uh, saw the um, world of the modern market society once again as alienating and mm -hmm. exploitat exploitative and oppressive of the working class. But Marx still very much bought into the Enlightenment conception, the mm -hmm. modern conception of progress. And he did see in the future uh, in a purely enlightened, rational world, which was a, hi a highly utopian and fantastic idea. But other writers, other, th other thinkers in many ways took Rousseau's 
critique in a different way. I mean, they, they came to believe that the whole world of uh, modern uh, democracy and modern science was somehow rotten. And what was needed, uh, people uh, in the generation after the French Revolution, mm -hmm. like the, the uh, French writer Joseph de Maistre, and of course most famously in the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche and others, began to see this, this world as rotten, and, and not just in need of uh, fulfilling the Enlightenment dream, but radically undermining. There was a kind of nihilism mm -hmm. that was also, in, in some respects, uh, not an intended, but I think an unanticipated result of, of kind of Rousseau's devastating critique of the modern bourgeois. And in many ways, that kind of nihilist, nihilist critique, uh, in, in a softened way, remains very much a part of uh, the, the, the tremendous sense of uh, kind of populist discontent mm -hmm. that, that, we, that we hear so much about today. Right. You draw on a number of um, li uh, bodies of literature. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Clearly, you do have an interest in literature, and, and how how does this um, how do the works illustrate the point you're trying to Wonderful. make? Wonderful. I'm glad you asked me that because, uh, in many ways, the book, uh, for me at least, I mean, it breaks a lot of new ground. I'm not. Uh, I've, most of my work is in the area of political philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, in that tradition. Uh, but literature, I've, I've canvassed a number of works of literature, which I think in many ways give extremely vivid expression to these philosophic and political currents that I, I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the first chapter of the book, where I'm beginning to outline the case and sort of make the case for the, for the modern bourgeois, begins with a, with a play by Machiavelli. We don't usually think of Machiavelli as a playwright, but I focus on his play, Mandragola. And the idea, what I think of as the idea of the protean self, a person who's constantly making and remaking and redoing themselves, which I think is very much part of Machiavelli's language, and it's very much present in, in, in Mandragola. And then I, I deal with several other kinds of literary works. Again, the, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, which is a of course, uh, an autobiography. Many pe many people think it's it's its own work of fiction in mm -hmm. its own way, uh, making himself as a literary hero. Uh, but then uh, I have several novels. Uh, I, I have a I think Flaubert. I have a cha ma chapter on Madame Bovary. No one uh, put the problem of the bourgeois more front and center than did Flaubert. He 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 had a kind of just aesthetic disgust for this figure, and uh, it's represented by a particular figure in his Madame Bovary, a man named o Ome, mm -hmm. uh, who's the town apothecary, the druggist in the town, and he represents everything that uh, Flaubert despised, a kind of, kind of belief in prog the progressive views of enlightenment, public education, public health. He's a great advocate for public health. Mm -hmm. And for, for Flaubert, this just represented just a kind of Philistinism that uh, was the outgrowth of the you know, heroic ideals of the French Revolution. Uh, here is what it's produced, a, a world of Philistinism and, and, a, and a kind of low-minded materialism. But Flaubert is a wonderful example. And then the book ends with uh, two, two chapters on, uh, I think, two, two extraordinary novels, mm -hmm. uh, one that very much uh, characterizes this phenomenon of the emergence of the bourgeois world, this one by an Italian novelist named Lampedusa, mm -hmm. Giuseppe de Lampedusa, his novel, Il Gatto Pardo, The Leopard, which is a book about an aristocrat, his, his ancestor, his based on his grandfather, kind of thoughtful aristocrat, contemplating the end of his order in Sicily and watching the kind of emergence of the democratic age at the time of the Italian unification in mm -hmm. the 1870s. And then the book ends with a chapter of Saul Bellow, one of my very favorites of uh, modern writers, mm -hmm. called Mr. Samler's Planet, uh, written in about 1970, where the, where the central character who's, who's a Holocaust survivor finds himself living late in life on the Upper West Side of Manhattan back in the 60s and 70s and contemplating, he's, he's, he, the, the, the question the book asks is, uh, here's a man who's lived through the destruction of one civilization, is he seeing it again taking mm -hmm. place another time? I actually have a uh, 
sort of a redemptive reading of Samler. I don't see it mm -hmm. as completely negative as many as many of the readers mm -hmm. do. But I, I think l these literary works, novels, plays, autobiographies, are, are absolutely central to shaping, you know, the kinds of dis bo both celebration of modernity and discontent with it that, that we that we feel. Was it difficult for you in terms of um, such a huge body of yeah. literature out there in in choosing um, you know novels and plays to draw from to um, make your points? It was extremely difficult and my, and my editor and I had several angry fights really? about, about what what should go in and the book is, is is long enough but it's considerably shorter than the one that I originally put mm -hmm. in because there was so much you know the, the, the topic is potentially endless sure. and my selections are, are admittedly somewhat arbitrary mm -hmm. Uh, they are for me a kind of greatest hits album mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a certain way of the of the books and works that I think are most illustrative of these themes. But of it, but they are the works after my own, my own tastes mm -hmm. and my own. So you know anyone could take issue. Why didn't you use that? Why do you use this? Sure. Why not that? And right. so on. But right, that was it was painful to 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 edit myself right. as, as it, al as, it, as it sure. always is but you know you have to you have to end somewhere right, and right, it, right. it could it can't go on nothing can go on forever true you know? true yeah. so ultimately what do you conclude in the book well the conclusion is um, it would the, the conclusion is in a sense that uh, what what I'm calling our discontents uh, are, are have just become uh, almost a part of our mental and cultural DNA. They have become who we are. The idea that we c we should d we should somehow get rid of these, or we can somehow grow out of them, or just you know kind of grow up and put these aside is 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 not right. It, it's not going to happen. Uh, to some degree, these discontents are a good thing. Uh, the discontents we feel they uh, avoid. Teach us to avoid complacency with, the, with again the kind of progressivist narrative mm -hmm. that we, we hear so much about. It alerts us to areas of, of 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 domination and control over our lives that that we that we should be to. And it just it just uh, is a, is a it a certain kind of gain. And in, in let, and although I don't want to embrace the kind of radical nihilism that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. For the most part, there are a number of people who represent what I would think of as kind of moderate discontent. Mm -hmm. Th those being in the book writers like Tocqueville, uh, Isaiah Berlin, Leo Strauss, uh, who very much understand the, these problems with modernity and the culture of the bourgeois, but don't necessarily think it needs to be rejected root and branch. Rather, it needs to be sustained in, in different ways by older traditions of thought and older practices that can help to sustain modernity without without exactly throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So I end by arguing, actually, uh, we need to sort of embrace our discontent, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a, that's ultimately a good thing. Right. Okay. Fascinating. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. For more information about Professor Smith and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.